So good evening, everybody. Welcome to the 2021 Fall Kelly Tucky Lecture in Historic Preservation. I'm Andrew Johnson, the director of the uh, program in Historic Preservation here at UVA. This evening, we'll hear the very exciting collaborative research focused on Providence Island, Monrovia, Liberia. This lecture follows a student-focused roundtable and a seminar earlier today in which we explored the possibilities and challenges of current international heritage practice. It's my honor this evening to introduce tonight's speakers. First, Dr. William Allen is Professor of History at the University of Liberia and has previously held appointments as Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Humanities, Chair of the Department of History and Vice President for Academic Affairs for the University. He holds a BA in History from the University of Liberia, a Master of Arts in Teaching from Indiana University, and a PhD in History, of, in history from Florida International University. Dr. Allen, a, pro a prolific scholar and historian, has published numerous works, including Liberia and the Atlantic World in the 19th Century, Convergence and Effects, Historical Methodology in Writing the Liberian Past, The Case of Agriculture in the 19th Century, and Rethinking the History of Settler Agriculture in 19th Century Liberia. He's developed and taught courses on the history of Liberia before and after 1822 and the history of Atlantic civilization from 1415 to 1888. The other speaker this evening is Allison James, a visiting scholar and lecturer here in the UVA departments of landscape architecture and architectural history. Allison, Jane, Allison James brings almost 20 years of experience in cultural landscape interpretation and community engagement projects to the fields of landscape architecture and historic preservation. Her work is focused on documenting, interpreting, and preserving cultural landscapes. She's currently leading a field school pilot project in Monrovia um, to train Liberian and UVA students in historic preservation while serving as project lead for the feasibility study of Providence Island for the World Monuments Fund. So please join me in welcoming William Allen and Allison James. I can take my mask off. Um, it's, it's an honor to be up here with, thank you so much, Andy. It's, it's an honor be, to be up here with Dr. Allen, um, who came from Liberia to do this lecture. So um, I'll, I'll go first, and then uh, Dr. Allen will follow. First, I want to thank Alison Grunder, former uh, Deputy Chief of Mission for the American Embassy in Monrovia, and John Robbins, Deputy Chair of ECROM, for being here tonight. Um, thank you to the Program of Historic Preservation um, and, um, and uh, Architectural History, the Department of Architectural History. Um, I'll be talking to you tonight about research and teaching that we've been conducting in and around Providence Island for the past year and a half. Um, Dr. Allen will give a more in-depth study um, of Providence Island and the surrounding cultural landscape as an, and its importance to Liberians. Providence Island is situated on the Messerado River in the dense urban center of Monrovia, you can see in West Africa here. Um, and it's really at the intersection um, between several communities, in a dense, this very densely populated area. The World Monuments Fund is wrapping up a feasibility study funded by the U.S. Department of State Ambassadors Cultural Fund for Cultural, Pre Fund for Cultural Preservation 
the three-year study, uh, sorry, the one-year study revealed several dynamic layers of sociocultural histories and human and non-human entanglements. The site is at once a monument to freed American slaves who settled on the island in 1822. After they forcibly, were forcibly or voluntarily immigrated by the American Colonization Society to form the modern nation of Liberia, and almost one third of the settlers came from Virginia. Prior to that, the island was known as uh, Dezoa, meaning the land in the center of the water. In the language of the Gola ethnic group, the indigenous inhabitants of the region. Oral histories describe a traditional school that was used for initiation ceremonies by the Gola people. So today I'm going to talk about um, first conducting a feasibility study and what that means for the World Monuments Fund over the last year and a half. Collaborating with colleagues in Liberia, working with stakeholders to connect many different narratives of Providence Island, creating new methods to teach across the Atlantic, and conducting remote and in-person field studies and the introduction of a field school. These are some of the, the research methods that we're using for the feasibility study. So first, we looked at archival documents. That was our first approach to the study. Um, and then we moved into stakeholder engagement. Um, and what I can say about that is these are all overlapping methods. So as we're uh, working between these methods, they all intersect at some point. So with the archival research, a team of research assistants between Monrovia and UVA have been working together for the past year and a half, pulling together a collection of archival documents from repositories, including one at Indiana University, which is especially important, and um, also the American Colonization Society collection at the Library of Congress, uh, among several others. Stakeholder engagement um, has been uh, really an effort between uh, many different partners, especially the U.S. Embassy in Monrovia, and uh, they connected us to groups of stakeholders, including the National Council of Chiefs and Elders, Slipway Neighborhood Council, University of Liberia students and faculty, and the Ministry of Information, Cultural Affairs and Tourism, and um, uh, the Mu Museum Administration and, and many more partners, all important to the narrative, the narratives of um, Providence Island. And then learning and teaching across the Atlantic has been really amazing. Um, in the spring, I was asked to teach a course here at UVA on Providence Island um, from here in, during COVID. My colleague Mamua Freeman Moore, Dean of the, the Honors College at the University of Liberia, has been instrumental in arranging applications, checking in and guiding students on the UL side she and I um, uh, have been working back and forth, and I started teaching a cultural landscape interpretation course. Um, and that's really just been this collaboration between UVA and the University of Liberia. And then um, we continued this way of teaching this semester in the departments of architectural history and landscape architecture. And I'm teaching a studio around the island this semester, which is uh, just been so much more um, engagement between University of Liberia and Liberian colleagues and UVA and students, and we've been learning on both sides. And then remote and in-person field studies. Um, I've been to Liberia twice in the last year during COVID. Um, between drone mapping, which I'll talk about in a little bit, Field surveys, student research around the river, and collaborative mapping on archival projects, including um, collaborations between UVA and UL students. We were able to learn a lot from each other, um, both in Liberia and the US. So my objective here, my objectives here, 
are to make informed recommendations for the World Monuments Fund for a framework towards the preservation of intangible cultural heritage, including dance, ceremonies, celebration, music, and teaching based on in-depth research, but also to broaden and deepen these connections between the University of Liberia and UVA. Analysis of con existing conditions reveal that um, at this time, at this moment in the history of the island, there are several key symbolic tangible elements, and those include 100 plus year um, cotton trees believed to be embodied by the spirits of ancestors, a water well that has yet to be dated, but it is included in the oral history accounts from traditional leaders. Other structures include um, several concrete structures that were built in the last several years, and then a replica of the ship that arrived, uh, that the settlers arrived on, was put up in, in 2020. Who are we interpreting with, not for? So this is not my story. It's really important for me to approach it in this way. I'm very clear about that. As I approach the interpretation of this island, I'm careful to listen, to find intersections between narratives. The narratives of Providence Island are varied and complex, symbolic, and sometimes need to be decoded by my research assistants and colleagues in Liberia so that I can move forward in a very culturally specific way. I have a lot to learn. As an outsider, I listen to oral histories, work with archival documents, and bring, bring what I think I understand back to the stakeholders and listen and listen and listen to stories about the island. And then I need to always check my assumptions. So our research assistants, like I said, have been working across the Atlantic. Um, They've never met in person, but they formed relationships. Um, we've been, like I said, working across methods, one feeding another, as I just described in the introduction. And that brings us into really what I want to talk about next, which is um, student work. So this is Priyanka Parachur's individual uh, research of a botanical network, uh, so looking at culturally specific use of plants um, as it relates to trade in and around the island. And um, here's an example of three students bringing their individual work projects together to curate a collection of letters from freed slaves to their former masters in the US and images of first impressions by Liberia, by Liberian, um, Liberia co uh, colonizers of Liberia and expeditions and individual impressions of these histories by a Liberian student. So these are some examples of what's being done in the classroom. Um, all summer, UVA student Matthew Schneider taught himself how to fly a drone and how to use the software um, that is needed um, to point cloud map the island. At the same time, a Liberian research assistant, Derek Coley, did the same in Monrovia with the help of U U UL research assistant Thomas Gamalway Jr. They also learned to point cloud, so they've been point cloud mapping the surrounding areas. So in the last couple of weeks, these images have emerged, and it's really incredible what's, what's come out of this. Um, my studio is using the data from, from these um, drone maps to create a 3D model of the island and digitally and physically um, create this for, for their own use in the studio. And then they're going to project site plans onto the model. And um, so we hope to continue to, to work in this way. And 
really, we, in this way, we launched a field school, uh, what we're calling a field school, the first part of it, uh, where we work across the Atlantic, remotely and in person. We're planning to bring, with a State Department grant, we're planning to bring um, seven Liberian students here in the spring. And um, we're also hoping to bring a group of UVA students there next summer and also continue the field school. Stakeholder meetings are, like I said, a very critical part of what we do and really critical to understanding the oral history of the island. Um, this is Chief Sanzan Karwar, and this was in November of last year. And um, here we are listening to an hour long oral history of the island and surrounding area. Here's a group of Mandela Washington fellows who came to the island um, to do an identity workshop um, and start to think about the island in terms of where they are and how they came to the island and then um, how these stories might intersect with their own stories. I've given a couple presentations at the embassy to Liberian government ministers, faith leaders, and community leaders at the ambassador's residence. And then field work um, is probably one of my favorite parts of the whole thing. This is a 200 year old cotton tree. So this is the peace tree um, where peace talks took place in 1822. And then again, um, in 2000, Three, I believe that's wrong on the, but anyway, um, the importance of this site can't be overstated. Um, this is a symbolic site for so many Liberians and I'm going to let Dr. Allen go into that. And then we keep, we continue to study the symbolic elements and their meanings. And then we continued to check our assumptions. So as I was standing in the pavilion, performance pavilion on the island, I looked out and noticed over the weekend um, in Slipway neighborhood just across the water, um, there was a huge football match, huge soccer match. And this was really the center of the community. This is really the, the public space that's being used the most. Um, and everybody's engaging from different neighborhoods. And you know the life, this whole place comes to life on the weekend. And then I, I assumed that these uh, pieces of cloth on the wall were just covering up holes or, or somehow um, weren't, weren't really being used for anything. And then one of my students in the class said, no, 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 you see the fishermen. So you see the fishermen here in, in the boats. Those are traditional fishing boats that are have been used for centuries and they're still in use and they're still very much a part of this cultural landscape. And he said, look, I mean, if you look closely, fishermen are taking a break. So that those are very important rooms to the fishermen. They go in, they change clothes. You know, they're, they're, um, th this is a place they eat, they rest, and then they go back out and they fish. So just assuming that I know what I see, I can, I can never assume what, that I know what I see. I need to ask questions and keep asking and keep asking, because again, this is not my story. So we're going to continue in this way. We're going to continue to ask questions, to listen, to investigate, and um, to bring the story to life in, in, a, in a broader and deeper way, um, and then connect it back to UVA. Um, the first president of Liberia's wife was an enslaved laborer at UVA. So if we think about that and all the complexities of this site, how do we move forward from here? Pretty incredible story. And if I stand up here and thank everybody that I want to thank, uh, Dr. Allen will run out of time. Uh, but I just want to say thank you to all of my colleagues, my mentors, my partners, um, all, everybody who made this, these uh, studies possible. 
And, um, and I just want to say, um, I appreciate all of this work going forward and look forward to more conversations in the future. And I'll hand the mic over to Dr. Allen. Let me say a, a big thank you to Allison James. Uh, Allison recruited me in Liberia to work with this project. So I wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for Allison James. So Allison, thank you a whole lot. My thanks also go to Ms. Allison Grunda in the back, who was, who was the former deputy chief of Mission Liberia. Her dedication to this project is uh, significant. Thank you, Allison. Let me also thank UVA, Dimalo Hudson. Thank you a whole lot for having me in UVA. Uh, thank you to Andy and all of those who made my trip here possible. Thank you very much. Let me also thank Baranka Parishu. I think I'm mispronouncing her last name. But her patience with me, I will send my work to her and she will patiently do what I ask and return it to return it and ask of her high inner suggestions. And I kept sending her work and she kept doing it patiently. Thank you so much. Uh, I was given the choice, the choice where I could stay behind this plexiglass and remove my mask. I could put on a mic and wander around. And the choice, my first choice was to like, I want to wander a little bit, but I said, well, I've kept the mask on so long. Yeah, at least let me remove the mask, <laughs> give me a chance to see uh, who's speaking. So, I want to look at Providence Island from what I consider it's a monument of conflict and unity for Liberia. That's what I see, uh, Providence Island. And, and that's what I want to talk about today. And at the end of my presentation, you will realize why I chose this topic, why it is significant at this particular period. This is the Republic of Liberia. And uh, for those of you who haven't been to West Africa or who don't know the geography of West Africa, I assume most of you know, uh, we are bounded, we are surrounded by Sierra Leone in the West, Guinea in the North, and Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast in the East. And there are 15 counties in Liberia, we have counties in Liberia, 15 counties. And Providence Island that we are talking about is situated in Montserrat County. And Montserrat is where we have Monrovia, the capital of Liberia. Uh, Monrovia was named after President James Monroe uh, from the United States. He had made federal funds available for the first group of immigrants that traveled from the United States to Liberia. Oh, sorry. Oh, good. Yeah, that's it. You got it? Yeah, I got it. Yeah. So, uh, we don't know when the first human beings appeared on Providence Island, but there have been several archaeological studies in Liberia. I think the first study was done in the 1960s, and uh, the, the next study took place in 1973. And uh, in recently in 2019, studies were done in Providence Island and then also in some areas around Monrovia. Uh, according to those studies, human beings appeared in Liberia uh, around 2260 BC. Now, the site for that, the site for that, uh, the site for that, for where the artifacts were found, it's, it's a river in Monrovia called it's a river called Po River, and Po River is about it's about 20 miles west of Monrovia. This is where they found several microliths, and those microliths were dated, they were carbon dated, and they dated 2260 BC. So the point is, I don't know how how early human beings appear on Providence Island, but just uh, 20 miles from Providence Island we have a date of 2260 BC. The other sites you see in red are other prehistoric sites. 
where they uh, pawn shares, they pawn uh, macrolates and other prehistory uh, items. This is an example of some of the broken uh, pottery fragments that we have found uh, in some of the prehistory sites. This is an old ceramic pot. We used to call it in Liberia the country pot. Uh, that's what we call the common the country pot. It was used to cook in, and uh, this is just an example of one of those. I mentioned the archaeological study that was done on Providence Island. It was a savage study. The cotton tree that she mentioned, uh, the cotton tree that fell, the uh, one professor, Matthew Riley from New York, was happened to be in, I think he went to Liberia, and he he was able to collect some of the items that they ex, that when the when the cotton tree fell exposed these relics and some of them included uh, local and imported ceramics. The important thing is that most of them were dated, most of them were dated uh, in the late 18th and 19th century, and these are from Providence Island. Now, so. Providence Island and the immigration of free blacks. So the question becomes, uh, why did free blacks leave the United States to immigrate? There were several reasons. But one, of the, one of the most important reasons was the trepidation of, of, of slave owners, that the presence of free blacks in the midst of slavery uh, will be an inspiration for those who are still enslaved. And one of the ways in which they will be inspired is resistance to slavery. And there were several slave uprisings. In fact, one was in, was in Virginia in the 1800s, was led by Gabriel Apostle. Then you had several other slave rebellions. The one of the most vivid ones are the ones that really sent shock waves uh, in the United States is the Haitian Rebellion, where former slaves were able to overthrow the masters and in 1804 it led to the independence of Haiti. So the, the, the goal was to remove the free slaves and the ACS were organized uh, to implement that goal. They were organized in 1816. Its founding president was uh, Bushrod Washington, who was a uh, nephew to the, the founding president of the United States, George Washington. So the goal was to remove the free slaves from the United States, but there were others. There was some. There was there were others who expressed humanitarian sentiments. One of them was Francis Scott Key, I think the famous author of the the lyrics for the national anthem for the national anthem. A Key and another another person called Robert Finley from New Jersey. They were convinced that free blacks or blacks in general would not attain freedom in the United States. And so they believed that returning to Africa gave them the best chance to, to retain or to restore their dignity and to develop in Africa. But in spite of this humanitarian sentiment, the, the driving force was to remove the black because they served as a threat to the property which were enslaved Africans. So the first group departed from the United States in 1820. They, they departed from New York, and after about I six weeks on the Atlantic Ocean, they disembarked in Sierra Leone. And this is a, we just got this image from, from the internet, so this is not the Elizabeth, <laughs> we just got that. So, uh, out of the 86 persons that disembarked in Sierra Leone, a large number, I don't know exactly, I've seen different figures, died, I think about 2018 died over time, mainly from unfamiliar diseases and also because uh, they had not prepared properly for what they had, for what they, they would have encountered in, in Freetown. So many of them died. So why in Freetown, the ACS sent its scots along the Atlantic coast to find a place for, for these free blacks? But the first question, I think I should go back to Sierra Leone. Why did they land in Sierra Leone in the first place? Well, they went to Sierra Leone because the British government in 1787 
had established a colony in Freetown, which is now the capital of Sierra Leone, uh, for free blacks. These have been free blacks who have fought on the side of the British during the American War of Independence. Those who fought, some of those who fought on the side of the British went to London and they were in London and humanitarians, including William Wilberforce and Grand Big Shark, they were able to rally support to send these free blacks to Africa. Again, they were convinced that blacks, free blacks would now find equality and, uh, and freedom in, in, in London. And so they send them to, to Freetown, but it's not Freetown. So the ACS did an investigation and came into contact with those who founded the colony in Freetown. And they gave the assurance that when, they test, when the immigrants come, they can stay in Freetown until they can find an appropriate location along the Atlantic coast. So the settlers arrive they're in Freetown and the ACS sends its car to look for a location along the west coast of Africa. And they end up in what is now Monrovia or Liberia, the coast of Liberia. They went to the chiefs and the chiefs agree after a long period of haggling, the chiefs finally agreed to cede the territory, including the Providence Island, that at the time was inhabited by a British trader called John Mills. Mills were trading on Providence Island, but they were able to purchase the island from Mill in conjunction with the adjacent territory, this Cape, Cape Montserrado. Now, this is according to the agreement. There are questions about the agreement, but these things took place. They received a certain of goods uh, estimated at about $200, and I was checking it would be equivalent roughly to about $4,000 in, $4, in today's purchasing power. So on January 7, 1822, the immigrants that were in Freetown, that had been living in Freetown, others had joined them from the United States. They came to, they came to the coast, and on January 7, 1822, they took possession of Providence Island. They were on Providence Island. Uh, the island was previously named Dozo Island, as Allison explained, and Dozo, she mentioned, it's uh, Gola, were one of the ethnic groups in Liberia. So they called it Dozo. The immigrants named it, they renamed it Perseverance. Later on, it was changed to Providence Island. They were indicating the, the hardship they have gone through and the endurance, and yet and still, their determination to find a place along the coast of Africa. I think in the end, they agreed that it was all providential at the end of where they were, so they called it Providence Island. So, the, some of the, 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 the earliest conflicts between the indigenous people who were in the majority and the settlers took place on Providence Island. There were, there were several opponents to this agreement, several chiefs who said, look, those who relinquish the territory had no authority to do so. So they began to challenge the agreement. They said, we're not familiar with this agreement. We didn't accept it. The chiefs also claimed that the presence of the settlers and the settlers had made it known that their intention was to abolish the slave trade that, that continued along the coast. They said, we are not going to permit the slave trade to continue here. And that was a concern for the settlers because from about 1500 with the, with, the, with the disembarkation of Europeans on the coast of Africa, the settlers have been trading, I mean, the indigenous people have been trading with, the, with Europeans. They have been exporting spices, ivory, and also exporting human beings. And the settlers made it clear that they were going to prohibit the, the exportation of human beings. Also, the, 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 the indigenous people were concerned, those who opposed this agreement. Their concern was, another concern was, that the site that had been given to the settlers, they had significant cultural value. And to relinquish the, the territory would be really giving up some of their cultural sites, and they, are, they were opposed to doing that. One example of that, of the cultural site, and Alison alluded to that, was the, the education, a traditional education system. There's a traditional education system in Liberia and in parts of West Africa. The, uh, that system educated youths, including male and female, 
the male education school was called Poro uh, in several languages, including Pele, my, my, my mother's tongue, and also Sandy for the girls. Because these schools were, were located outside the village, outside the community, in secret areas, in the secret part of the bush, in a secluded area in the, in the, in the forest, foreigners called these schools secret society. Uh, secret society, these were the schools. And uh, the duration for, the, for this education, where the, the girls learn how to be excellent house, housewives, uh, farmers, the men learn to become good hunters and good leaders in the village. They tell you from my experience for uh, growing up, it was about three years where you had to go in. They went in uh, this age group and for three years. And after three years, they will come out uh, reborn, new birth with new names. And that will be days of celebration. This is an example of the female Sandy graduates who were dancing after several years of education and rebirth. So these are some of the concerns that the, uh, the indigenous people express uh, that giving up the land would be giving up their co important cultural sites. These opposition, the opposition to the, to the relinquishment of the, uh, of the territory led to two epic battles. One, this, uh, November 11, 1822, the second December 1st, 1822. And the last battle, which uh, we learned it was epic battle. If the settlers had lost, uh, probably we would not have a Liberia today, uh, but the settlers prevailed. So the Republic was founded in 1847. The Republic was stratified. The ruling class consisted essentially of the free blacks immigrant, the free black immigrants that had returned, the recaptured Africans. Recaptured Africans are Africans that had been liberated on the sea by American Navy boat and also the British patrol boat. Some of those were resettled in Liberia, others were resettled in Sierra Leone. So we, the group is called recaptured Africans. The next group in Liberia were the Barbadians. About 346 Barbadians had arrived in Liberia from Barbados in 1865. So this group comprised the ruling class in Liberia. Uh, by the mid-century, they were all known as Congos because the recaptured Africans claimed that the majority claimed to have come to have been captured in the Congo and they were being taken to, uh, taken to slavery when they were liberated. So the entire group became known as Congos. The majority indigenous people were largely marginalized in this process. This led to the violent military coup of April 12, 1980. After about 133 years rule by descendants of the free slaves, soldiers of indigenous extraction seized power in April 12, 1980. They executed some of the leading members of the descendants of, uh, of free slaves who were governor officials, the Speaker of the House, several secretaries, and so forth. And the military seized power and uh, we, had, we experienced a military dictatorship in Liberia. And that was spiraled into our recent civil war. So, why do I say all of this? There's a conundrum. We have a conundrum now. We say Providence Island is essential. It's very important to Liberia. It's, it's a monument to Liberia. It's an area of conflict and convergence. To the indigenous people, it represents a loss. Sovereignty of indigenous, they lost their sovereignty, sovereignty over the land. Origin of the settler and Congo division, that Liberia experience. But yet, the founding of the Republic of Liberia was an important experiment in black nation building. In the age of prevalent racism in the United States, in the, 18, in the 19th century, the notion was that uh, 
there was a pyramid and on the top of the pyramid you had the Caucasians and at the very bottom you had the blacks in terms of in terms of mental capacity. So the founding of the Republic of Haiti dealt a blow to that, to this notion that blacks were incapable of ruling themselves. The founding of this black republic in Africa were also very important. Also, uh, in spite of this, this, this conflict and this division, but there was convergence, a slow coming together of the various groups. We have been doing that through intermarriage, for example, and through assimilation. Those also went to school, got an education. Uh, we became part of the, we became part of, of the Liberian society. And intermarriage, and a good example would be, uh, I use myself, I look at myself. My mother is indigenous Liberian, and my paternal parents came from the United States. So there are many Liberians who come from this cross fertilization So the question is, how do you commemorate a heritage that is conflicted? To one group, it represents the best thing that, that ever happened to Africa, that the creation of a black republic. To another group, it represents the loss of their culture, essentially, and also a loss of the identity, uh, because some of the indigenous people had to change their names just to get access to uh, education. Uh, they adopted the names of of, uh, of descendants of, of free slaves uh, who uh, in whom whom they lived. So how do you celebrate that? The president of Liberia announced the bicentennial of the free slaves arrival on Providence Island. Before the military coup, the date for the arrival on Providence Island, January 7, was a national holiday. It was called Pontius Day. And the indigenous class, as those who began to gain education, they protested against the holiday, but the holiday was in place. The, the protests were based on the argument that it is divisive. Why are we recognizing the day of our conquest, essentially? So the president said we are going to commemorate, we are going to commemorate this day, this bicentennial. So I said, how do we commemorate? How do you do that? And this is a question that uh, Liberians are trying to answer. It appears that the president's intentional decision to, uh, to uh, commemorate this date is part of the process of convergence, convergence part of the process of discarding our hybrid identity and trying to fuse a one national identity. Thank you very much.